Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on Google Tools for Optimizing Your SEO. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host today, and our presenter is Nalini Gulzarin. More on Nalini in just a minute. Today's webinar is sponsored by First County Bank. So I'd like to invite uh, Jaguan Singh, the business development officer at First County Bank, to say a few words. Uh, Mr. Singh, can you take yourself off mute? Yes, I certainly can. How are you? Good. Good. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. As you mentioned, my name is Jay Singh, and I'm the Assistant Vice President of Business Development Officer for First County Bank. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that's participating in the event today, as it's an honor to work with SCORE. We have done this many times in the past, and I always found, found these uh, events, uh, webinars, to be very successful. And you guys will walk away with a lot of valuable information. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a background about our bank, uh, so First County Bank is a mutual bank. We've been around for over 170 years. Uh, we only service the Fairfield County, starting from Greenwich all the way down to Bridgeport. Uh, we're close to about two billion in assets, and we have 15 branches throughout Fairfield County. Um, and one of the best things I love about First County Bank is uh, we actually have a First County Bank Foundation, which we started in 2001, and we have donated over $12 million to local nonprofits within uh, Fairfield County. Um, and just like other banks, we offer a variety of, uh, you know, personal business wealth management products. So whatever you need is, please feel free to reach out to me. And it's always an honor to work with SCORE. So Tim, thank you so much. And I would like to get this started. Thank you. And uh, now some uh, brief info on SCORE. Uh, so we're a nonprofit national partner of the SBA. SCORE offers three primary evaluated services to small business owners. First is free one-on-one -on -one counseling. Second is educational workshops and webinars like this one. And third, we have extensive resources on our website to help you build your business plan, as well as a network of subject matter experts at your disposal. Our next live webinar is Tuesday, February 21st at noon, when Nalini, once again, will cover Instagram SEO, tips to increase your reach. Look for the specifics on fairfieldcounty.score.org. We also have a large number of recorded webinars on our website that cover a wide range of business topics. These can be viewed at any time by clicking on-demand webinars. Some useful info about today's event. We've set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end sharply at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next day or so. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Nalini Gulsarin. Nalini is the founder of Edgespace Marketing and is passionate about transforming business practices and streamlining communications. She has a BS in computer info systems and experience in IT, project management, and communications. Before becoming an entrepreneur, she was an associate COO for a division of a global financial institution. She believes in the strength of her community and regularly volunteers for organizations and causes that empower the next generation. I'll turn it over to you, Nalini. It's all yours. Thanks, Tim. And thank you, Jay, for joining us from First County. So we've got a lot to cover today, and I'm going to do my best to go slow but fast. Um, we are going to talk briefly about what search engine optimization is. We're going to talk a bit about how to set up your Google Analytics, your Google Search Console, and how to understand basic reports. There's a lot you can do with these platforms, and unfortunately, we won't have enough time to get into details. And for those of you looking for the Google for Analytics, that's not covered today simply because of time. Um, in future classes, we'll be sure to cover the new Google for analytics that are coming out. We're also going to briefly talk about how to submit your sitemap to Google, why that's important, how to set up your Google My Business, and then how do you let Google's tools, the search function, trends, Google Keyword Planner, how do we basically let Google help you find your keywords or at least the keywords people are searching for so that you can get found for them? One of the biggest things that I identified with SEO challenges is that if it's not a technical issue, a lot of times it's a keyword issue, meaning you're targeting the wrong 
wrong keywords or you're not targeting the keywords at all that you should be. So this will help you get a sense of how do you figure out what that is. So let's really start with SEO. Search engine optimization, the real question is, are you on page one of Google? The really goal that you're trying to aim for is how to increase the quantity and quality of the traffic to your website so that you can show up in search engine results. All traffic to your website is not always good traffic. If you're a flower shop and somehow your SEO is misconfigured and a ton of people are showing up to your websites for plumbing, you're not going to list or rank as number one for flower shops because Google is going to say, well, you don't seem to be an expert when it comes to flowers. Probably something either your website's about plumbing and they misunderstood or your website is misconfigured, which Google still misunderstands. Why is that important? Back in the day, some of you may have understood when the internet first became super popular, we started getting computers at home. Google was competing with search engine uh, platforms such as ask.com, ask Jeeves, Yahoo was a competitor, Bing is still a competitor. And there's a couple other ones cropping up. The goal is Google wants you to continue to come to them and use them. This is gonna be very interesting to see over the next year or so as the AI wars kind of ramp up and we see what chat GPT and other search engine platforms are gonna do. But in the meantime, here's how Google works. When somebody wants to find information on the internet, they either type or say what they're looking for in, into a search engine. We're asking Google, we're asking Siri, we're asking Amazon. These are all places that people are searching. Google's crawler is going across the internet and gathering information about all of the content they can find on the internet. And what they're doing is taking that information that they're finding, feeding it into their machine, which is more or less the algorithm, and the algorithm spits out results to satisfy the user search query. The thing that you want to keep in mind for a successful SEO is that it's always about the end user. What does the end user want? Are you satisfying the end user's questions? Did the end user come to your website, find what they're looking for, or did they leave and go to your competitor's website? And are they more often going to your competitor website? Those are some of the reasons you may get overranked. So here are some important aspects of your SEO to keep in mind. You want to make sure you're using your uh, Google Keywords, Google Trends, Keyword Planner to identify those keywords. You want to configure your on-site and your off-site SEO. So those are the technical aspects. For those of you who are not familiar, we have the SEO basics class that cover all the different ranking factors and where you put your on-site, excuse me, on-site and off-site uh, keywords. You wanna make sure that you configure your Google Analytics and your Google Search Console. A lot of folks are very familiar with Google Analytics and the Search Console is often forgotten. And I'll explain the difference between the two in a moment. And then you want to make sure that once you configure your Google Search Console, you submit your sitemap to Google. You want to make sure that you also set up your Google My Business. Now, for those of you that are solopreneurs, you might have some concerns for this. Any business right now, whether you are a physical storefront or a virtual business, should set up a Google My Business listing. It helps add to your credibility. It helps Google give you trust and authority factors. It's also a great place to collect reviews. So let's talk about your Google Analytics. You get there by going to analytics.google.com. And let's, why do you need it? Why is this so important? Your Google Analytics will help you track your website traffic and user behavior. So a lot of the reports in your Google Analytics, which is pretty comprehensive, the basics when we talk about the key metrics in a moment are really just the basics to get you started. Once you get familiar, you can start digging into where which pages users are landing on, which pages they stay on the most, where do they drop off in the, the, the navigation of your website. There's a lot you can do with it. So here are some key metrics you want to consider. How much traffic are you getting to your website and how much return traffic? People coming to your website is great people returning to your website is even better. And that's what we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're allowing people to come to our website the first time. Maybe they're still building awareness. Maybe they do not yet have a desire to buy. And with the Google Analytics, we can see not specific users, but we can see how many users are coming back. The next important metrics on your Google Analytics, and just a reminder, these are your the original Google Analytics. These are not the G4 Analytics. On the original Google Analytics, you also have your bounce rate. Your bounce rate is the number of times a user lands on your website and exits without going to another page or interacting with your website. That means they didn't click call you, they didn't click your email, they didn't click the contact form, what, however your website is set up, they just left. So one way I describe it is think of a bouncing ball. If this is your surface, a ball hits the surface and it leaves immediately, it bounces. Google is using that same methodology when it comes to user traffic. 
They land on your website and they leave immediately. Google's looking to see, okay, you may have a one page website and that's okay. My bounce rate is fairly high. I tend to tell people that you're, what you're looking for for a good bounce rate, unless you're an e-commerce site is anywhere from 40 to 70%. Meaning most people are coming to your website to validate who you are. They're coming to get your phone number. They're coming to get your email. They're coming to see your hours. They're seeing your location. They're not necessarily sticking around more than 10, 15 seconds. That information should be readily available on your homepage and your footer. And sometimes if you have a one-page website, your bounce rate is going to be higher by design because the reality is, is they're scrolling straight down on a one-pager. They may not click anything, which is also okay. You have to keep that in mind. You can also see how long users are spending on your website. You have an average of eight seconds to grasp their attention and get a conversion. And that number is actually shrinking. Social media has shortened our attention span and people are highly impatient. Your eight second count starts the minute they click a link, type in your domain, whatever it is, your website is loading. This is why page speed matters. If it takes more than three seconds, the average user approximately 50% of the time or more will go hit the back button and go find someone else whose website is loading faster. They're very, very impatient these days. That's why your page speed matters when it comes to how long users are spending on your website. If you have somebody on your website spending more than one minute, according to your average, um, how long users are spending on your website, that's pretty good. You definitely want to keep that up and make sure that your content continues to drive that. You can even see device and location data. What type of uh, devices are they coming? It's funny how often I get arguments from people saying, a lot of my users aren't coming on their phone, they're not coming on their tablet, and we can validate that. Every website must be mobily responsive. It doesn't matter how much of your traffic you think is not coming from mobile devices, Google cares. These are all things that land and uh, influence your ranking factors. You can also see which pages are popular. Which pages do people come to, how long they're spending on the page, and then when you get a little deeper in the reports, you can see which page they go to next if they do. That particular functionality is changing with the new G4 analytics, and so we want to make sure that we um, keep that in mind because some of these metrics will look different in the new analytics. You can also see, and this is very, very important, how users are coming to your website. How many of them typed you into Google? How many of them typed in the name of the website right into the domain? So like score.org, if that's the direct domain name, right into the browser bar. And then where they're coming from, referral traffic, your newsletters, your social media, backlinks, other referring sites. This is a really good place to get a sense of how much of your traffic is coming from other sources or how much of your marketing is working together. So here's how you set up your Google Analytics. Once you're already logged into your Google Analytics, you're going to hit the gear icon in the lower left corner. Then you're going to head to the middle of the screen and click Create Property. Here in Property Setup, you're going to type in, this is not the domain name, this is however you want to call it. So in my case, Edge Space Marketing Score may say Fairfield County Score. This is for your own internal reference so you know what you're looking for, especially if you have more than one website. This is important. Set your time zone. This is very important to make sure that you're tracking your traffic uh, accurately. This is also helpful like when you get your reports to say, okay, there's low traffic on Fridays at 3 p.m. That's probably a good time to do maintenance. Other websites may say Friday at 3 p.m. is the highest traffic time. Don't do maintenance. Those are reasons why you're having your time zone set accurately is important. You then want to click on show advanced options. The reason for this is you want to set up both a Google for analytics and what's called the universal analytics properly, which is the original. I haven't set up too many of the Google for analytics yet. A couple of things that we know. It can be a little trickier to set up because it sometimes requires a little more technical finesse depending on your platform. Shopify, at least as of two months ago, was not yet working with the Google for analytics. So if you're setting it up and you still have the opportunity to set up the combined analytics, it's just easier if you do both. So this way, when it's time to migrate to G4, you already set up and Google's already doing this kind of mandatorily right now. If you've seen any of the announcements, if you have the universal um, property set up, all of us have gotten emails that say, if you haven't set up your G4, we're pushing you over there soon because G4 will be the mandatory analytics as of July. You're then going to put your domain name right there in the website URL box. This is very, very important. Notice that it says www.edgespacemarketing.com. The www. used to not matter. It matters now. 
If you purchase your domain as edgespacemktg.com without the www, do not put the www here. What you're going to end up seeing and when we get to the search console are reports airing out saying URL redirect. It actually took me six months to figure this out for another client where we weren't getting data. And all of a sudden I realized the person who built the website put in the, the domain as the without the www dot and then set up the analytics and the search console with the www dot so there was no data so you want to make sure that you're being very specific about how you're using your www dot you want to go back to what did you purchase from godaddy or wherever you purchased it from and then you also want to make sure what um is domain is showing up in the browser bar when you are searching for your website what is the primary domain as i mentioned before you want to make sure you click the button that says create both properties and then click next. The enhanced measurement is on by default. I don't turn it off. We don't yet know, at least for me, I personally don't yet know what that means in terms of the advancements. So I figure it doesn't hurt to collect the enhancements right now. You'll then answer a couple more questions about your business. You can choose to not answer these questions or you can go right ahead. It's usually easier to just answer them. I think Google's just running a survey. Then you get a pop-up that shows you these are your details. You have a measurement ID in the upper right corner, and down towards the bottom, you have site tags and a bunch of other things that are happening. Depending on how your website is set up, you may need one or more of these numbers. It just depends on your setup specifically. I've had people that have had to connect it to their Google tags. I've had people that are using the G4 analytics, which begins with the GE. And then, of course, the most common one is this universal analytics number, which is ua dash a very long set of numbers. Whichever methodology you use, these are the different places you're going to get it. Usually the platform you're using will tell you what it wants. Different platforms have said, I want that G number that's in the upper right corner. And then other platforms definitely say, give me the UA number. So you know which one you need to pull for them. So now that you've set it up, you need to understand the reports. Here's a report from my website from this is actually uh, late last year. This is not a current report, but this gives you a sense of how traffic is performing and we'll talk about how to interpret and understand it. The first thing we see in this universal analytics reports is users. These are the number of unique users that have come to my website. I can also see the total number of sessions. This really means visit. So this means that 404 people over a period of time, some of them or one of them came back a hundred more times to generate 501 sessions. And of course, I alone probably generate 20 something sessions when I go in there to do maintenance and those type of things during this reporting period. As I mentioned before, my bounce rate is about 70%, which is for me what I expect. I have set up my website in a way and my marketing plan is working where people are coming to my website to validate who I am. They're checking the website, they're checking to see if they can cross-reference whether I'm teaching a class and like, oh, this person really does exist. I always tell people, if you are a business and you don't own a website, think about the old philosophical saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one was there to hear it, does it exist? If you're a business without a website, do you exist? Are you legitimate? Are you a scammer? Do you have enough experience? These are questions your users are asking of themselves. Google's also asking, right? So you need a website to get traffic in the first place anyway, but there's some more to it than that. In my case, I have designed my marketing around my bounce rate of 50% because or to 70% because I expect people are coming to just validate. If you see a report and you have a 100% bounce rate, that is bad. This is one of those numbers where the reverse of what you think is correct. Most people I've seen, I've actually had somebody say, I have 100% bounce rate, I'm doing great. I said, no, that means 100% of the time people are coming to your website and leaving very quickly or immediately. So you're actually not getting proper traffic to your website. So the lower the number, the better. And usually 50% or lower is mostly e-commerce because you're on there poking around, comparing products, looking at other things. So those are the things that influence how long users stay. You can actually see specifically how long they're staying per session. In my case, I have a 70% bounce rate, excuse me, 70% bounce rate with a session duration of one minute or higher. I'm quite happy with that. That means that they're sticking around for a little bit of time and looking at things. Even though the people who are leaving are may not be contacting me, that's okay. Remember what I said earlier, quantity and quality. That means that the few users that are left are my target clients that are most likely to do business. 
you're also looking for potential spikes in this graph. What this spike is telling you is that you're looking to see what happened around that time. Did I drop a newsletter in the middle of January to cause that spike? Did I run a campaign on social media? Did somebody else run a campaign that I'm backlinked from? The reason this graph is important, it informs you of how your marketing effort is working. Whether you're doing anything or not doing anything, you're looking for trends. You're looking for details around how often and when. You're making some informed decisions based on what you're seeing. So then we now have to talk about your Google Search Console. Why do you need it? You set up your analytics to figure out how much traffic you're getting to your website, where is it coming from, how long are they staying, but what you don't know is what keywords did people type into search to find you? And this is where your Google Search Console comes in. Your Search Console informs you of what keywords were at, like the actual phrases, words and phrases that were typed in, the ones you showed up in the search results and the ones that were actually clicked. So you can get a sense of how you're actually performing. So the other thing you can also check for with your search console is if there's a technical issue or if your site map is missing. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, I spent six months trying to figure out for a Shopify client why we were getting no Google Search Console details. The, search, the analytics was producing traffic data, but we couldn't figure out why she wasn't showing up in search. And when we looked at it, I finally dug, dug through the reports and we saw that there's this redirect. Now with Shopify, if those of you are familiar, there's a few different ways redirects can kind of happen. And we kept trying to figure it out until we realized that www dot is now a problem. So in your case, this is where your search console becomes very important. If you're not getting traffic, Traffic to your website, you're not getting the right traffic to your website, you can dig a little deeper to see what's happening. So how do you get there? It's not as straightforward as your Google Analytics where you can type in analytics.google.com. The best way to get there is to go to Google and literally type in Google Search Console. You'll then come to a screen like this most likely, which you'll then click Start Now. And to be honest with you, those of you who's even used Google Search Console before, this is a screen you will get no matter how many times you go through this method of getting there. Once you get through that start now, if you've already registered Google Search Console before or are put as an admin or an owner or have some permissions on anyone's account, this is what your screen should look like. In the upper left corner, there's a drop down which shows you all the different websites that you were listed for. And if you remember earlier when I was setting up my Google Analytics, I had www. And then here I have it without the www. So what I was doing this demo of at the time, the Google didn't care as much because they were kind of synonymous. In the last month, that has changed. And so we need to be more mindful of being very specific about www. or not www. Once you click your drop down and find which property you belong to or which property you have access to to view the data, you'll then start to figure out how do I add my property. So you might not have anything here. If you do have other ones, you'll scroll past them and click add property. When you get to this screen, I always tell people do the URL prefix, not the domain. It gets a little tricky and you have to do a lot more technical setups in terms of DNS verification and those type of things, which a lot of folks do not have that technical acumen. As much as I'm technical, even that confuses me. So I use the URL prefix where I'm literally just typing in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash and my domain name. You'll then get a pop-up. In this case, it automatically verified my property using the analytics I've already set up. This is why this is a lot faster and you don't have to do too many other things. You then want to submit your sitemap to Google. So this is you're still in your search console. The property is still, in my case, still edge space marketing. Left side is the screen. There's a button for sitemaps. When you come here, you type in, in that box there where it says enter sitemap URL. And then in this case, you can see that I submitted my sitemap originally November 15th, and the last time I read was February 20th. So the, of course, this screenshot is from February 20th or just around there. What you'll find is when your sitemap is submitted to Google, Google will read it periodically. And so you sometimes see a two or three day lag. If you see more than a two or three day lag on the last read of your sitemap, that's an indication that something might be technically wrong. Google may no longer have access to your site. Your uh, somehow might have gotten unverified. There's a few different reasons for that. So this is one of those ways I mentioned talking about checking for errors and seeing if something is wrong. Now, a common question we get is how do I know what my sitemap is? 
for the common platforms, if you're using WordPress with the Yoast plugin, it's going to be sitemap underscore index dot XML. You're looking for your XML sitemap. Squarespace, Wix, and Shopify are all using sitemap dot XML. If you're using Weebly or something else, just go to Google and type in what's the sitemap format for those uh, web platforms. And then you can go ahead and type that in. If you have a custom built website, please make sure you're talking to your developers about the sitemap updates. Every time an update is made to your website, whether you update a page, you add a picture, you change the word the somewhere, you fix a typo, the sitemap should be updated to reflect the date and time of the change of the page. This is an indicator to Google to re-index your website. The more often your site is indexed, the more opportunity you have to show up in search. So how do we interpret those performance report? So first things we're gonna do is on the left side of the screen, we're gonna go over to performance, which brings us here. When you come to the screen, you can see the top queries. Queries are the specific keyword, singular word or phrases that people typed in. When you move to the right side of the screen, you have clicks, excuse me, hit the wrong button. We have clicks and we have impressions. Impressions mean how many times you showed up for that search. That does not mean you were number one. It doesn't even include your ranking. This means you just showed up somewhere. So in Google's aggregator, you could have been position 99. You could have been position 200 and you could have been position three. It really just depends on how you're configured. But the starting point is you're seeing how often you're showing up in search. And then clicks tell you how often they're clicking. So when I'm looking at this list, I'm looking to see, are these keywords I've specifically targeted? Are these keywords that Google's just assumed that I should belong to? And what you're looking for here is to see if there's any issues with your keywords, meaning maybe you have the wrong keywords in places. Initially looking at this list, I have edge space, edge space marketing, website pricing calculator. I do have a calculator on my website. It was kind of an attempt at a marketing funnel that didn't quite work out and I've just left it. That website cost estimator go hand in hand with that. There's Google SEO best practices, which come from the classes that I teach. And then here we have web design calculator. I haven't specifically targeted that keyword, but Google's saying that people who are looking for website pricing calculators, website cost calculators, are also probably looking for website design calculators. So this is what happens sometimes when you start to see this list grow as you start to target your SEO specifically. You'll start to see Google associate you with keywords that you may not have specifically targeted. You can use this to make informed decision. Does this mean that you can use these keywords in blogs, in other places, enhancements to your keywords? Something to keep in mind is user behavior changes and over a period of time, they may now start to target different keywords or a different order. Like I always mention this, there's one in particular that I personally am annoyed by, SEO optimization. Spell that out, you get search engine optimization, optimization. That is grammatically incorrect. So that's not something that I would use as a primary keyword anywhere. I'd probably use that offsite, hidden in a file name, or maybe I use it inside of a blog somewhere. So that if somebody's trying to call me out on grammar, it's not that big of a deal and it's not front and center. Now, if I'm looking at this report and SEO optimization is number one on the list, then you know what? I have to bite the bullet and put in that grammatically incorrect phrase because at the end of the day, it is about what users are typing into the browser. What are they asking Google about? And that's what we need to make sure the end users come first. So then we have to now figure out your Google My Business. This is another component that you can use. And as I mentioned earlier, if you are a physical business, you should definitely have this so you show up on Google Maps. If you're a virtual business, you should also have this. Up to three years ago, 2019 was when Google said virtual businesses can now have a Google My Business listing. There's a couple nuances to it. So let's go over that. So first thing you want to do is go to, you can go to Google and type in Google My Business or as the direct URL was on the slide before. You're using this primarily to gather reviews, set your hours, put your contact details front and center, but it's mostly to gather reviews. We live in a day and age that's called inclusive marketing. Back in the day, it was called exclusive marketing where brands were creating this little niche that you had to be in the in club to be a part of because it was exclusive, exclusively for their audience. And brands said they were great and people believed them. As seen on TV meant something. Now, if we see it on TV, it's been Photoshopped, it's CGI, we don't believe it. We don't believe brands. We're going to strangers on the internet to get real user feedback. So this is why gathering reviews is so important. When I build websites for clients and we put testimonials on the website, I recommend no more than 10. 
The reality is, is you can make up their testimonials on the website unless it's directly linking to a person or you're showing that person's identity, which most often you probably want to protect your client's identity. By using Google to collect and gather the reviews, people are making their own honest reviews of you, which other people, your potential clients, will read and be more convinced to use your services. Anyone can use this if you have a free Gmail account and if your business email is set up through G Suite. So most people go through Office 365 because that's what comes with GoDaddy and a couple other platforms. But if you did go through G Suite, like Wix does G Suite, you can also link it. So EdgeSpace, my EdgeSpace email is through G Suite and I'm able to use that as the master account for all my different Google stuff. You can control your contact details and hours. You also wanna list your website here. This is all adding to your SEO ranking factors. And if you're location-based, you will show up in Google Maps. Why is that important? Most of us are now doing things like, show me chiropractors near me, you know, balloon vendors near me. The word near me, that phrase near me, is become tantimonious with every search when you're looking for a business or a physical location. Even businesses that don't have a physical location, like virtual businesses like mine, when you're looking for web development, SEO vendors near me right? Whatever you're searching for, the near me becomes important. But how does that work for businesses where technically the phrase near me is meaningless for our business? When we go to Google Maps and put in our Google business, right? Google can say, okay, this business is physically in this vicinity. And then you can put in your service area. So if you're a business that has a very specific service map, meaning you're, you can only drive so far up Fairfield County to service your clients or down to New Jersey, right? You have a finite map. You could set your service area. So when Google's looking for near me, you're showing up in that specific area. If you're in a business like mine, that's technically international, it's a little trickier. So I have my service area scheduled for the entire United States because that's just easier than trying to name all the countries in the world. What, and as I mentioned before, here's how the local searches work when people are looking for near me. So now you wanna set up my Google My Business. What are some of the best practices? When you're going through this, you wanna either claim or add your business. Most often is your business is registered with the state. Somehow Google has access to the database as far as I can tell, and it shows up already and then you can claim it. There's a several different ways to verify. Often you only get the postcard method, which means they will mail a postcard. And if you're a virtual business like mine, it'll come to your house. And a lot of people get nervous at this step because now their home address is out there. Your address and your listing is not published until you finish the verification process. So you do need to give Google your real address. PO boxes are problematic. Google doesn't like to send them to PO boxes. And I've had clients that live in countries where the only method of mail is PO boxes. And then you have to go through a whole lengthy process to get around that at the end of it, after you get denied and then you have to appeal it. When you get to the verification screen, this is very, very important and it's very tricky. I don't know why, but Google lets you fill in your hours, your contact details, all these things. And what we found is somehow it's flagging these accounts because you're putting in the details before verification is complete and the accounts get suspended. So what I highly recommend is once you get to the verification screen, stop. Wait for your postcard, wait for your email, whatever your verification method is. And then from there, you will progress to your next screens after you verify, then start filling in all your details. This is very, very important, this last one. Do not put anything in the business name line other than the name of your business. So I can't say Edge Space Marketing LLC, Digital Marketing Small Business. Do not put any keywords there. I specifically named my business with a keyword in it, for that reason. So that's why it says Edge Space Marketing and not just Edge Space LLC. I put a keyword in my business name, but that is all you can do. If you do anything more than that, anything else in your business name, Google is checking that, I guess, against the state registry and will flag and suspend your account for scams. This became particularly problematic in 2020 when the world shut down, everybody went virtual. A lot of scammers and spammers popped up trying to commandeer business listings to drive traffic to their fraudulent websites and steal business from real businesses. So Google tried to tamp down it, which resulted in some chaos, which is what we have here. So I do recommend you follow these rules and you should be fine with setting up your Google My Business listing. So now I've mentioned all these keywords that you have to put in and you're like, how do I know? This is always a question. I'm throwing spaghetti at the wall to try to figure out what are my keywords? This is where the fun starts. Let Google help you. How do we do that? First things first, you have to figure out where to look in Google. Here are some really common places that people overlook when they're looking for their keywords. 
use Google search prediction list to help you. This is their autocomplete feature. Here you can see I started typing in SEO keyword. I didn't even finish typing in the word keywords, plural, and all of these things have come up. When I'm looking at these autocomplete answers, what I see right off the bat are, you know, SEO keywords search, SEO keywords Google, SEO keywords phrases. That's something I'm going to flag because maybe that's something I put in a title. If I'm going to write a blog, I put it in the body of something. I name a file after it. SEO keyword search tool. Now you want to be careful, right? I don't offer a keyword search tool. I don't have a blog about it. I don't have links to it. If I were to use that keyword phrase, SEO keyword search tool, technically is, I'm catfishing, right? It's clickbait. Because if somebody's looking for a search tool and they come to my website and I don't have it, they will bounce. They will leave. In my SEO ranking factors, I will drop in ranking. So this is why it's important to make sure your keywords are actually applicable to your business. I'm also seeing on here SEO keyword generator, SEO keyword research, that's a really good one. I could write a whole page on that. I could write a paragraph on that. I talk about it all the time. How to do SEO keyword research, right? That's a phrase that I could use somewhere on my website because I'm my website speaks to it. So just make sure whatever keywords you identify in this list, you actually use it meaningfully. The other thing to keep in mind, especially with these AI tools coming onto the market, Google is looking for something called natural language processing. That means that they're looking for the language on your website to be the same way we speak. So be careful about that. This is why my whole SEO optimization keyword bothers me is because that's grammatically incorrect. And maybe people speak that way. I don't know if it's nuanced enough yet to continue to use that in a place where Google is expecting correct grammar, checking for misspellings, those type of things. For example, if I put in somewhere SEO keyword search Google somewhere, that's grammatically incorrect. That's not really a natural way of speaking. And if I did try to use that, Google may flag me for keyword stuffing. So that's why you want to use this as a starting point. It's not your end all be all. There's also a section on most search results that say people also ask. So here are some things for SEO keywords that people also ask. What are keywords? How do I write SEO keywords? What are examples of keywords? All three of these things are things that I can put in H2 tags, H3 tags on my website. These are things I can use to name a blog. I can name file names after it because all of these three questions, just the title of them, are relevant to the content on my website. They're relevant to my target audience. Now, if I am running, let's say my business was all about SEO and none of this type of information is on my website. This is an indicator that I would not be given trust or authority by Google in that space. While I may have all the knowledge, if my website doesn't translate that, how do you know if you're actually going to get found? Google knows because people coming to your website will probably bounce because if they're looking specifically for that and you're not providing it, they're going to go to your competition. Google also provides something called suggested searches. Now, something to keep in mind of all of these things are coming on your website, or excuse me, on your search results in the order that they're showing up and here in these screenshots. So here are some suggested searches that Google gave me just for the SEO keyword. SEO keyword tools, list, generator, example, list of keywords, keyword tools, free SEO keywords. And now I'm looking at this list saying, okay, this is pretty repetitive. And what I would normally do at this point is try a different search. I would go back to Google, put something else in, like maybe SEO best practices and see what shows up. So this is how you start to generate that list. You're looking to generate a list of five to 25 keywords or keywords phrases, because you want to be careful. Remember that keyword stuffing, you can't overuse certain keywords. So Google's looking for that variety. If you use this method, this is one way of generating the variety of keywords or keywords phrases that you need. So then we're like, okay, we've searched for all these things, but I'm still not convinced. And maybe that's a little complicated and that's not quite working. You also have Google Trends. So you get there by going to trends.google.com. And here's why you want to use Google Trends. You can actually see what people are actually searching for. So the answers that I showed you on the previous screen are predictive. Google saying people who have this kind of mindset are also looking for this info or have also asked these questions. But Google Trends is where you can get to specific, for example, SEO optimization versus SE optimization, right? Like those type of things to make sure that you have your keywords in the right order that you're looking for related searches. And I'm going to walk you through some ways to use Google Trends to your benefit. 
You can also see what's cap currently capturing the public's um, imagination. So for those many years that I've been doing SEO, this particular screen right here for Google Trends has been the same for all of those years for some reason. They don't update these, four, these three starting blocks, but if you scroll further down, you can actually see what the most popular uh, trends are happening right now. And they give you a bunch of different categories that they've determined people are interested in. But then you can get into the nitty gritty and start searching for your own stuff. And then you can also use Google Trends to figure out where there are seasonal factors to your marketing strategy. So where you can use Google search to identify the keywords themselves, you can come to Google Trends and validate how those keywords perform. And I'll show you why that makes sense and how that works in a second. Here's an example where I typed in flower shop, flowers for mom, and gifts for mom. What we're seeing here is that you can do, you don't have to do a comparison search. You can do a singular search, which is just in this case would have been flower shop. But this is to show you how you can check how different keywords are performing against one another. So what do I see in this report? Flower shop is obviously performing. Gifts for mom has some performance, but the phrase flowers for mom is pretty flat. There's a few different spikes in a couple of places that are very, very minimal. And maybe I don't want to use flowers for mom as my primary keyword. I'm probably thinking flowers for mom is what people are looking for. But here, Google is telling us people aren't really looking for flowers for mom. I do get the question, what does, uh, excuse me, what does interest over time mean? Like, what's this volume of 100? It, if you click on the little question mark, it gives you a really confusing answer. This isn't the number of searches. This is just giving you a volume of interest. So I'm not exactly sure what formula they're using, but they're just kind of give you a sense of, does this keyword perform anywhere on this graph is what you're looking for. Flat lines are not important. You may even see, um, meaning flatline keywords, don't use those. If you see an actual flat line, I wouldn't recommend using those. You may see something that says not enough data available. Now, if you've changed your parameters from United States to Connecticut, past 12 months to one month, all cat are like those type of parameters, you may have narrowed your search too much and you may get that. If you're doing it at the state level and you leave it, or excuse me, the country level and you leave all the de default settings and you still get not enough data, that tells you that that's not a keyword that's performing at all. Like that phrasing that you're using, try rearranging it, try different versions of it and see what happens. As you come down your report, so scrolling down the report, it shows you interest by subregion. I actually don't use the interest by subregion report at all. What we tend to find with this report is it's a misnomer. It doesn't, at least for the work I'm doing with my clients, it doesn't give me enough information to really be informative. We also find, depending on the search criteria, most of middle America has no data. From VPNs to data privacy concerns and those type of things, consumer behavior in influences how Google gathers this data. So if you're using a privatized network that has no tracking, Google doesn't have that data. So just bear in mind with a grain of salt how you're using these reports. So here you can see this particular flower shop perform, you know, these are the top states. You know, again, not really helpful for a particular flower shop in Connecticut. But what we do see under related topics is corsage. So topics are basically like broad topics that can have subqueries underneath it. And then you have queries, which are the specific phrases. So the topic corsage can have a bunch of different ways people are searching for it. So you might have to then figure out what are the phrasing that goes inside corsage. So corsage alone is not your keyword. There's other keyword phrases you have to figure out. We come over to the related queries, but people are actually searching for Corsage, Google told us, right? So you're not guessing, you're actually getting some validated information. So if you're a flower shop and Corsage is a product that you offer that perhaps you're thinking, you're looking at your sales report saying, yeah, I sell very little amount of Corsages, I don't need to target that. This report is telling you right here that if you're a flower shop, Corsage is probably a big deal and you wanna start using it in your keywords. We dig a little further into Corsage and this again is the interest over time. And remember earlier, I mentioned seasonal trends. Here you can see two spikes in the graph. What we're looking for here is the first spike. It looks like it's to be about May. We know that's um, home, excuse me, uh, prom season. So that makes sense. And then when we come down to September, that's homecoming season. So if you haven't quite you know, looked at your sales report and saying, oh, sales are flat, it's not the only way to decide it. This is telling you, you have a seasonal trend that you wanna keep an eye out for. Corsages obviously perform consistently throughout the year. It's not flat at any place, it's not at zero. So there is some interest throughout the year, but you have two major spikes. 
you go a little further down to your report to your related queries and your related topics and you get excuse me you get a different sense of what to look for so in your related topics we have um colors we have ribbon we have homecoming and prom which i mentioned earlier but when you get into your queries look at the specific phrases these are exactly what people are typing in and the phrase do you wear a corsage for homecoming has uh excuse me the camera's covering up has 4800 percent more performance than the word corsage alone that right there is if you're writing blog a blog topic if you have a social media account a social media topic these right here one two three four five on the right side of the screen are keyword phrases for your website if you're selling corsages Google has told us. So this is how Google Trends help us inform our decisions for our keywords. So then really quickly, we'll talk about the Google Keyword Planner and then we'll wrap up so that you guys can ask some questions. When you're looking at your Google Keyword Planner, it is going to be going through your Google Ads account setup and a lot of people get nervous and because Google Ads are pay per click, they don't wanna mess around with it. I tend to tell people Google Keyword Planner is more advanced, even I don't use it. This is really if you're looking for serious high volume, you have an international business or a national business, most hyper-local businesses, if you're doing all the other research, may not need this. But if you're an advanced level users and you're here, this is where you can actually see what the average monthly searches are. So remember we talked about on the trends report that you have an interest over time, but you don't actually know what the volume of search is. Your keyword planner is telling you what that volume is. It also tells you if it's a low competitive phrase, medium competitive and high competitive. What that is indicating is that if something's highly competitive, it may be hard to rank for that. And you have to take into some other factors into consideration like um, uh, the website that's been there, how long it's been there before you. Does, you know, do, are you competing with big brands? For example, if you send handbags and you have these custom made locally sourced handbags, but you might be competing with Macy's has a line that has the same thing. Those are some of the th reasons why understanding the competitiveness of your keyword. Again, this gets really tricky and you can get lost in a, a rabbit hole. So I don't recommend too many people go in this route unless you are planning to run Google ad campaigns. Here's my two cents on it. If you are gonna run Google ads, you hire somebody who is certified and an expert. If your Google ads are misconfigured, you will pay for all those clicks. And I've heard too many horror stories of people owing Google thousands of dollars because something was misconfigured, the ad didn't turn off when it was supposed to. It's really um, sad, but when you sign them up, you agree to their terms and conditions, all those fine prints we just click agree to, says that you'll pay them regardless if the clicks are configured poorly or accurately. So again, if you are gonna do this, make sure you know what you're doing. And if not, make sure you hire an expert who's certified to do Google ads. So um, uh, Tim, we have about 15 minutes for questions, I think. Yeah, that's great, Nalini. Uh, yes, uh, I'll get the, some of the questions right out of, out of the way. Uh, we don't possess uh, copies of the uh, presentation. We consider that Nalini's uh, intellectual uh, property. Uh, but you'll all be sent a link to this uh, recording, and you can uh, replay it and stop it, pause it at key parts during the presentation. Nalini has given you a lot of helpful screenshots of the uh, the screens you'll actually be using when you step through this work so i'm sure a lot of you will be uh re replaying uh the recording uh so nalini i don't know if, if you want to open up q a and sure. uh, yep i'll start with the first question here which is um when you set up your google and your google service area what do you recommend for a company that has a b and m address serving the public but also has an online presence selling worldwide. So to translate that, they're talking about their Google My Business listing and they have a brick and mortar, they have a physical presence and they have an online store. So in this case, what you would do is your Google My Business listing is going to be specific to your brick and mortar presence because the Google My Business listing is linked to your Google Maps. That is really important and you want to do that. In your description, you can mention visit our website, you know, we ship worldwide and that way you can cover your selling feature and your website itself. You want to make sure that the products that you're selling, those are the things that you're going to want to focus your keyword listing on. In terms of how you sell and where the, the ship to, that's something you would definitely include on your website, but not something you want to really worry about with your Google My Business listing or even your SEO keywords. The bigger part is the products themselves that you're selling are showing up in the search results. Uh, the next question is, is where can I find a one-page report 
to present to my board for analytics and differences in engagement? This is a very good question. So when you go to analytics.google.com and you navigate to your the analytics for the website in question, that, in, that whole page itself, you can technically present to your board. It just depends on what time frame you're looking at. Uh, by default, your reports will show you seven days. And on the bottom of each of the tiny reports, you can change it to 28 days, 90 days, one year, set a custom um, time frame. So sometimes you can go back and get historical data if you want, if it, your analytics was set up and gathering data from that time. Each report says on the bottom, open report. So it really depends on what your board is looking for. For example, today I was working with a client. We're really focused on social media traffic to the website. How is all the social media campaigns driving to the website? So what I did was I went to the reports. We have the top of the house reports that are there. I scroll down to, I believe it's called the acquisition report off the top of my head. And then I clicked open report and I can see from there where the traffic was coming to my website. Did it come organically? Did it come from direct? Direct means they typed in the name of the website.com. Did they come from social media? There's also something for referral, which might be your newsletter. So there are a couple of different reports and it really depends depends on what you're looking for. But again, if you just go to analytics.google.com, just make sure the time frame you're looking for is set on the different reports and you can screenshot that page if that's what your board's looking for. So here's a very interesting question. If you have a company name that is different from your website name, can you still claim your Google My Business or do you have to set up a DBA? This person has a publishing company and would like to claim one of the book series that are published already, but it's different than the LLC name. So this is a little tricky. This is where you can end up in that accidental banned suspended area of Google. What I recommend is that your Google My Business listing should definitely be matching your company name or your DBA. Your website itself can't should match the name of whatever it is you're doing. So for example, if the name of my business was NaliniConsulting.com, um, or excuse me, Nalini Consulting LLC, but my domain name was edgespacemarketing.com, Google's going to say those don't quite match. And I may rank for other things, but I may not rank correctly for either the name of my business or even my domain. We actually have this issue with another client where there is the name of the business and then there is the domain name, which don't match. And the business just isn't ranking for neither that person's name, nor the business name, nor the domain name, because none of them are matching. So again, Match your company name to your domain name where possible. You do have to get a little creative. Like in my case, we have Edge Space MKTG because when I went to buy my domain name, somebody stole it and then tried to snap charge me $1,000 for it. So I had to work around them. So instead of getting edgespacemarketing.com, I had to abbreviate. But Google knows enough to say, okay, that's kind of close. That makes sense. You might have to put dashes in. I do recommend dashes over underscores. Underscores can get confusing, especially when you're printing on business cards. I hope you answer, that answers your question. That one is a little more involved, so feel free to reach out to me afterward if you want to get a little more specific about that. The next one is how can how easily, excuse me, how can I easily tell if my GoDaddy website is set up with the www prefix or not? It's a very, very good question. What I recommend is go to your browser bar and type in your go to your website and then click in the browser bar and copy it and paste it somewhere, paste it in an email, paste it in a Word doc, paste it on a notepad, see what paste. If it pastes with the www dot, then that's your primary, it's set up with your primary www dot prefix. If it doesn't, then it's not. So that's the easiest way to tell because for those of you who are not familiar, whether it's www dot or not, your browser bar by default may not display the w dot. So you wanna just kind of, if you copy it, click, click into it, highlight the whole thing, including the HTTPS, copy it and then paste it elsewhere and see what you get. That's how you'll know. What do you advise that we do if we're trying to convert from universal analytics to G4 and need help? Um, I would recommend, you know, you can do some Googling for some Google experts around you. You can reach out to someone like myself. You can reach out to SCORE to see if they have any recommendations. Converting from the universal analytics to G4 in your analytics themselves is very easy. The issue here for those of you who are not familiar is you now need to link the G4 to your website. And if you don't know how your website's configured or you don't know how to do that technical um, expertise that's needed for that piece, you may need somebody to help you. So um, for the person who asked this question, you may wanna reach out to SCORE, WBDC, SBA, see if they have any uh, folks who are familiar with it that can help you. Google's also your friend there. Another one says, also on my Google My Business for service area business, 
is there a way to configure the service area to just the continental United States? Right now, my USA service area includes Alaska, which is technically true, but very weird looking shape. Um, I think you can. I mean, I think it's okay. I think part of this is that I do understand the weird looking shape. So for those of you who are not familiar, you have the continental United States, and then your map extends for the Alaska piece above. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. I think if you try to get into that, you may confuse Google and hurt your ranking. Um, so I would leave it alone because that's pretty common practice for anyone who operates in the entire United States. Are hashtags still helpful or completely unrelated to keywords and search engine optimization? So they are completely unrelated to keywords and search engine optimization specific to your website, but not in two weeks. As Tim mentioned, we're talking about Instagram SEO where hashtags come in. So SEO has now kind of become a translatable term where it no longer just means Google search engine. It kind of means these other platforms. But when it comes to your website SEO, I wouldn't worry about hashtags as much as I'd worry about those keyword phrases with the spacing and the way people are actually typing it in. Uh, and then the last question I see here is, similar to a previous question, we mostly sell our roasted coffee online countrywide. However, we're looking to test out local delivery. Is it better to include the delivery area in our shipping area? That's a bit of a tricky question. I, since you're testing it, I may not um, advise that you change your service area or your shipping area because you don't want to lose that nationwide reach where people might think or Google might think you've limited your reach from nationwide to the small microcosm. So what I would recommend you do is maybe put that in the description or as a service, definitely have it as a section on your website. And then what you would do in this particular case is all of your other marketing efforts should support that, whether it's your newsletter or your social media. Those are places where you can try to drive that little test cycle. And then after you get out of the test cycle, we can look at, okay, does this really make sense? And if you're going to do it, what does a larger implementation look like? And to be honest with you, it may look exactly the same. Google My Business still has nationwide shipping with a little comment area in the description about local delivery and then your other marketing factors, including your website details, will drive towards that. Great. That's uh, that's the last question. So uh, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar and the materials will be available within the next day or so on our website under on-demand webinars, but you'll probably also be sent a link uh, to your email address. Our next live webinar is Tuesday, February 21st at noon with Nalini, and she'll cover Instagram SEO tips to increase your reach. Look for the specifics and registration on our fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling, so please use the link on the screen or visit our website and click Request a Mentor. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the uh, end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's live webinar. In closing today, a big thank you to Nalini Gulzarin for presenting today, and a thank you to First County Bank for its sponsorship. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.